I want us to cover two of the fruits of the Spirit tonight. Kindness and goodness. I'll throw those two in together. I have a speech impediment with the word kindness. In, in our culture in the South, it's kindness. But I can't do it. I have to find that D and shove it in there. So it, it comes out sounding almost weird, but kindness and goodness are the two things we want to talk about. Uh, start with a did you know. There's actually a World Kindness Week and a Random Acts of Kindness Week in the U.S. World Kindness Week is in November, around the 13th of the month. And then near Valentine's Day, somewhere in, in that week, is Random Acts of Kindness Week. So we're, we at least give a nod toward doing nice things for other people, and we call it kindness. Uh, a lot of schools have kind of taken up the banner and tried to do things that are geared toward that. It's been several years ago that we were in Franklin, Texas, and in the elementary school hallway, there was a big banner that said, kindness is expected. Uh, don't remember which teacher I was subbing for this year. Second grade, I think. Big poster on the wall that says, be kind. And just a, it's a great motto, sometimes a little more different, difficult to carry out. But here's a couple of the things I ran across that teachers have done to try to teach young children about kindness. One was a penny jar. The idea was, you know, first graders don't have any money, but sometimes they find a penny. And they had pickle jars in every classroom. They would put their pennies in the pickle jar. And when the pickle jar was full, then they would take the pickle jar and give it to Habitat for Humanity. And um, an amazing amount of money was raised just a penny at a time. And of course, they used it for math lessons. How many pennies do we have now? We're adding three more. How many does that make? Uh, guess how many pennies or in the, the full jar of pennies, that kind of thing. So you can, can gear it toward a math lesson, but they were trying to teach uh, kindness to the kids. And then an older group, I think this was a junior high group, wrote random acts of kindness papers. And they were told to describe three things. What they did, for whom did they do it, uh, I'm sorry, no, how did the recipient respond, what was the feedback they got? And then, how did it make you feel? So, what did you do? How did the recipient feel? How did you feel? And the teacher kept all of those. It wasn't necessarily for a grade, although they made comments about grammar and such things. But at the end of the year, the teacher passed those papers back out and they spent just a few minutes reading about the things that they had done to reinforce the idea of kindness um, the teacher read some of the papers to the class without providing the name of who did the, the random act or, of course, who it was done for. Um, Christians, it should be so ingrained in us that we don't need a special occasion to do it. Um, we don't necessarily need to keep score. In fact, Jesus kind of, at least in a roundabout way, discouraged keeping score on doing good things for other people. The idea of not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing when you're giving an alm or, or doing something kind for somebody. Um, when Becky and I were in college, right, right after we got married, we were living in her dad's cabin way out in the country and had zero money. Um, and occasionally, and it's fairly random, we would go to the post office on campus, see if we got any mail, and there would be an envelope that just said Jay and Becky Tyree and would have a $20 bill in it. And we have zero idea. We'll be 40 in January. We still don't know who sent those $20 bills, but somebody knew that there was a need, and they just were passing it off to the uh, mail carrier to stick in our box to just keep our heads above water while we were going to school. 
All right, the second thing we're going to talk about is goodness. And I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that kindness is the outward expression of goodness. If there's goodness in the heart of the person, it sometimes shows itself in an act of kindness. So we're going to try to work those two things together. One of the problems with kindness and goodness is that we have a tendency to compare down. Now, when you look at how other people live and we go, well, you know, I'm, I'm nicer than that, I'm kinder than that. Uh, but when we compare up, it's a whole lot tougher category. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the word good, can you define the word good? The opposite of bad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wholesome is a good word. What else you got? Our problem is that good is a little bit like love. We overuse it. It's a very convenient word. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Uh, how was your lunch? It was good. How did the band do playing at halftime on Friday night? They did good. Uh, well... It, it takes too much time to dig deeper, right? So you say, well, how are you? I'm good. Well, what about how you are is good? What do you mean when you say, I'm good? We don't do that. We just take good as a, as a good answer, and we just it's move on down the line. Yeah, we, we don't really want to know. I like the word nice. Nice. What does it mean? Have a nice day. Have, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's the opposite of, of not nice. Uh, but what did Paul believe? This is where we're going to start in Romans 3. What did Paul believe about people that are involved in a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Did he think that they were good people? Again, later on he's going to tell the Galatians this is a fruit of the Spirit. So if you're involved with the Holy Spirit good, goodness, kindness, are things that are part of that deal that the Holy Spirit is doing in you. But notice what he says starting in chapter 3, verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. What shall we conclude, conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now what we know, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. And he's going to keep working on that theme for several chapters. We'll look at chapter 7 here in a minute. But Paul seems to be saying even those who were faithful under the law weren't really capable of being good. Those who are faithful under the law of Christ not really capable of being good. There may be some good things going on but he doesn't believe that doing things in our lives makes us good. He would not have described himself as good. In fact, Go over to chapter 7 and see what he says about himself. Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now this is the Apostle Paul talking. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do. What I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, 
I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not live in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So Paul says, I want to do good. I'm capable of desiring to do good, which I think would give the hint that we're capable of knowing what is good. And we talk about the age of accountability. How old do you have to be before you know good from bad? Before you're accountable. But Paul says, what I want to do, the good that I know that I should be doing, I'm not getting it done. And the bad things that I know I shouldn't be doing, those are the things I do. So he knows the difference. He understands what good is. But he goes so far as to say, I know that within me, that is within my self, my humanity, there's nothing good. Is that just an overstatement? Is that just hyperbole? To We do good unto all men, and especially our brothers and sisters. There you go. As much as is within us, yes. we do yes. good. So there's got to be some good in you. There's got to be, okay? Be. Matthew 5, Jesus is talking about all the different things that that uh, his audience would do, uh, giving alms, uh, prayer, all those kinds of things. And eventually he says, I want you to uh, do your good works so that people can see you doing your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So there had to be something that they could do that was recognizable as good and that people would connect back to the Father. You've got a person, a human being, that Paul would say, I know there's nothing good within me. But somehow, they do something that's good and other people recognize it as good and then glorify the Father that this person has been doing something good. Let me ask you the worst question I'm going to ask you tonight. What, was Jesus good? Yes, he was. Excellent. Of course, right? For us to say about Jesus that he was not good is semi-blasphemous. Right? You just can't make that statement. But look at Mark chapter 10. And some of you may know where I'm headed already. Mark 10, 17. When I preach from this passage, and probably when y'all teach from this passage, you think in terms of the rich young man. And, and you want to talk about him and, and why he couldn't give up all of the stuff he had to follow Jesus. But Jesus says something in the beginning of this conversation that is bizarre to the rest of us. 17, Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees in front of him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. So Jesus does not accept the title of good teacher. He says you, you're misapplying the word. You can't call me good. Only the Father is good. Now, for those of us who are 21st century Christians, we would say, but Jesus, you are God. You are God in human flesh. You are the Word become flesh. How can you say that you're not good? What was it about Jesus at this point in his existence that he says, I'm not going to accept that title of good teacher? Could it be because he was ugly at that point? Yeah, he's, he's in the flesh. Yeah, he's still human like we are. Yeah, so living in the human flesh, he's saying... I'm not good in the sense of the greatest good. Right? I'm not as good as. In my current form, in my current 
incarnation. I am not good like the Father is good. So he makes a, a difference between his earthly existence and God's heavenly existence. But still, that that's amazing that Jesus would say something like that. Why would you call me good? There's no one good except God alone, meaning God the Father. Then he says, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false witness, don't defraud, and honor your father and mother. And the fellow says, well, I've done that all my life. See, to his neighbors and to the people that knew that young man, if you had said, is he a good guy, they would have said, of course. You know, this is a nice kid. He, he keeps the law. He's good. Paul chimes in over in Romans and says, I don't care if you keep the law or not. You're still not good. I don't care if you keep the law of Christ. You're still not good. You are somebody who is influenced by something good, but you yourself in your earthly incarnation, you're not good. And that's hard to hear because there's, like I said, there's so many things we think are good, right? Good barbecue. How can I not be good when compared to barbecue? Right? But we just use that word so randomly. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now here's some good stuff. Again, Paul doing the writing. Uh, you have to understand that Paul was a rabbi, a well-trained rabbi. And a well-trained rabbi could argue this side of the issue and then go sit on the other side of the table and argue the other side of the issue. It was how they trained one another. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad and I would drive my mother nuts because we would have debates across the kitchen table. And she would finally just tell us to hush. And, and we would eventually stop our clamoring. But the idea was, I don't really believe what I'm saying, but I want to test and see if you know what you're saying. So we would go back and forth and back and forth. And Paul was capable of doing that. So you have to take some of the things that Paul said to this group of Christians and see what he said to this group of Christians. It may be in a different setting, different situation. But anyway, here's, here's what he says to the Ephesians, chapter 2, starting in verse 6. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So if you need a definition of kindness, what's your definition of kindness? What God did for us through Christ. So the fact that I swept the porch at your house, you know, it seems like a nice thing to do, but kindness is the grace of God extended to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a good kindness definition. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what in us is good? Right? Paul says about himself and to the Romans, I know that in myself there is nothing good. But here to the Ephesians, he says we have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So what is it within me that is good? Or what is an evidence of the fact that there is something good going on inside of me. How others see us. How others see us. The works that God is doing through us. So if the emphasis is, I'm a kind person, we miss the boat. If the emphasis uh, is, I'm a good man, we miss the boat. The emphasis is that God, through his kindness, 
gave us salvation in Jesus and gave us good things to do so that people can glorify him when they see the good works that we do. But it's not about us or our goodness. It's about the good things that God is accomplishing through us. Uh, one of the neatest uh, examples that it, it pops up a lot in Christian music is the idea of being God's hands and feet. I like that metaphor. I like that imagery. That God is not here personally carrying out all the things, but he has created us in Christ Jesus to do those good things. That's our job. That's who we are. And the Holy Spirit has given us that uh, fruit within us to live out. So no, as a human being, I'm, I'm not good. As a human being, I'm not really capable of true kindness. But as a regenerated soul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, there are things that I can do to mimic the kind and good Heavenly Father so that people can, can see Him at work in my life. Um, what if we do those things and people look at us and say, well, isn't Tom kind? Isn't David good? Do we have a responsibility at that point to do what Jesus did and say, nope, don't call me good teacher. It's not about me. It's about my father. Now, Mark mentions it a little bit, but all through the Gospel of John, Jesus constantly deflects praise to say, I'm only here doing what my father sent me to do. He deflects criticism by saying, it's not me that you're criticizing. I'm only doing what the father sent me here to do. So one of the best ways to imitate Jesus is to live out that goodness, those good things that God has sent us to do while making sure that people understand. The only reason we're doing it is that it's what the Father wants us to do. If it wasn't what the Father wanted us to do, you know, to each his own. Do whatever works. But if the Father has a plan for your life, you better be involved in doing what the Father has sent you out to do.